as you hear the bell, just gather your thoughts and also pay attention to the sound disappearing gradually. Now, you may gently close your eyes if they are not closed, or you may keep them downward and bring your body to a resting position. And you bring your body to a resting position you notice your awareness catching on to things, especially the sounds, events that your mind brings to this moment from the past and from the future. And if you have practiced some meditation before, your attention may also go to your breath. So that is perhaps a habit that you may have developed. Whatever you notice, they come and they go. The most important thing is you remain like an observer, seeing all these experiences and not feeling any of them, any of those. <clears throat> Feel free to move mindfully. Feel free to cough, feel free to adjust in any way you like. Maybe take a deep breath in. Notice your shoulders going up and you may drop your shoulders as you breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Feel like scanning your body from the top of your head down to your toes, to the soles of your feet, noticing any discomfort, agitations, and moving away from them or sending loving kindness to each and every part where it is needing your loving kindness and perhaps a little bit of compassion to 
Feel free to do so. Notice your skin. Imagine that it is touching some healing at this meditation session. Emitting good energies into the room. Notice what comes to your attention now. Perhaps your breath again. So we stay present with the feeling of Breath going in and the breath coming out. Transcend to a deeper level. I will ring the bell again. It's like we did not hold on to the disappearing sound of the gong. We will drop anything that takes our attention right now. Generously letting go of those feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, Also dropping the brain's activity, sending signals to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical contacts in your skin, and thinking. Except when you hear these instructions, you stay present. Now you are present with your breath. Once again, because the breath is happening now. Not in the past, not in the future.
Whenever you feel distracted, you come back to your breath and stay present, making your breath a delightful experience, something that your mind likes to stay with. Perhaps investigating more of the details of it, noticing its changes and widening your scope of awareness, focus to your breath. As you begin to stay resting with your breath, resting in your awareness, notice things disappear from your attention. They feel far away from you. Sounds, basically the strongest active sense door, feels like those are disappearing from your attention. Or well, there's no need to react or find details proliferate based on what you feel here. Embrace them, welcome them if they are persisting in your present experience. No controlling. Just allowing things to be, letting things become, letting things come. Letting things go. Allow the membrane that surrounds your brain also to relax and cool down. Immersing in that coolness so your nervous system also begins to cool down. With the sense of well-being, creating more room to manifest spaciousness, tranquility and peacefulness. Things you could have otherwise reacted that your mind may feed into are just neutral feelings. Informed by ignorance. Perhaps craving to and delusion. So to deconstruct these formations, we stay with the reality of experiences arising and passing away. There is no experiencer. It's 
not I, me, myself making. Just things, stuff. In those lines, you may keep your work field and scope of awareness. And I will ring the bell again. For you to go deeper on your own until you hear the concluding bell in a couple of minutes. Feel free to come out of your meditation. (laughs) 
So now is the story time. Um, this is um, a story that has taught me many times since I learned it in my childhood. This is a Jataka tale. You know what a Jataka tale means? It's a story from the previous life of, of the Buddha. And this is called the Satyagumba Jataka. And so Satyagumba has a meaning. A bristling spears, um, like weapons, like swords that are bristling. And uh, so the Buddha has, in different occasions, taught different stories like this, relating it to a present story, um, an incident that may have happened in his life and wanting to teach something and also to show a pattern of life of this person who's, who's also kind of having similar tendencies in their present life. So this story is related to Devadatta. He is the cousin of the Buddha. He had this weird intention of wanting to be the Buddha. He thought uh, it's a it's a post title given by people to to the Buddha. So he didn't want to do the homework. <laughs> he didn't want to do the exams and and wanted to um, proclaim that he's the Buddha. And I can see why that happened. Um, I think he had had these rival tendencies from the childhood. They played together because they were cousins. And um, so he perhaps knew um, the former person, Siddhartha, who was, was playful, but also was his rival and thought he could um, beat, yeah, beat him, beat him mortal. and he will tolerate that and also um, um, uh, compete and, and uh, perhaps knew the weaknesses like that, mm. of weakness of being silent, mm. more tolerating, more um, uh, res maybe welcoming uh, bad deeds. So he thought he could easily um, do that. Uh, but Buddha means someone who has realized the truth. And if you have not realized it, um, you cannot teach it. You cannot establish Sangha, monks. Um, so what Devadatta, uh, the name is beautiful. Deva is heavenly beings. Datta means given, given by heavenly beings. It's, it's a beautiful name, but the acts he did were not give, uh, given by heavenly beings. He caused um, bloodshed in the Buddha. He he rolled this rock from a, from a, I think it's called the vulture's peak. He knew where the Buddha was doing his walking meditation, and he climbed up and was hiding behind this boulder and managed to push it. But apparently, the story goes as. Um, that another boulder, another rock stopped it. Maybe they say it's because of the power of the Buddha, but somehow it didn't come crashing down and killing the Buddha. But a small piece broke down from it and um, injured, I think, the right foot of the Buddha. So monks started talking about it. But when this happened, Buddha's physician, Jivaka, Dr. Jivaka, uh, treated the Buddha. But the Buddha used this as an opportunity to teach uh, monks, saying it, it's only not only in this lifetime, but in previous um, lives too, he had these cruel, heinous, evil intentions. Um, and he had, it's, it's the same pattern that we are seeing now. And the story goes um, to talk about two parrot brothers. They, uh, they were caught in a storm and they fell 
uh, they were carried away and fell into two different locations. One, one brother fell into the hermit's uh, monastery and the other one fell into the, the cave where bandits were living. So now you can guess the company they both received, very different. Um, so this one time, um, King Panchala, this, this king went hunting into the forest. So he saw a deer that he wanted to hunt down and he was chasing the deer and got lost and uh, he got lost closer to where the bandits were. And there was this tree and the king and his advisor began resting under the tree. Uh, and then suddenly he heard this voice coming from a distance. And the voice began telling things like, uh, kill, rob, take everything, have no mercy, things like that. And the king and the advisor began um, examining, uh, investigating, and they found it was coming from a bird, from this parrot. <laughs> So um, so the bird adapted the, the thoughts of cruelty and chanted them repeatedly. Um, so then, otherwise, the king and the, the advisor prepared to attack, thinking that this was a real enemy approaching. So they, they began, you know, going to a safer place. They thought there must be some danger here. So they went to another uh, area where there was um, open pasture. And then there was this other voice they heard, compassion, gratitude, humility, humbleness, restraint. Um, these, uh, in these um, words, um, instead of saying kill and stuff like that, he was, um, they, they, they heard things like, compassion and stuff. So, and they were so amazed. And that too was coming from another bird that was a parrot too. So the king approached them, approached the bird and asked, you know, where did you learn this? And the bird didn't seem uh, startled by the presence of the king Panchala. At that moment, the parrot said, I learned this from the hermits living here and I live with them. And the king was so pleased and, and the parrot invited uh, the king and the advisor to the, her, uh, the, the hermit's monastery, a hermitage, right? And uh, the, the hermits welcomed the king and gave, uh, gave him and the advisor a resting place and water and all. So they felt safe. So, um, and, and, the story, usually the kids learn how uh, the message of the story that uh, if you learn, if you associate bad guys, you learn, you adapt things that bad guys uh, teach you and it becomes normal to you. You think that that is how people, that you start to see the world through those lenses. It's like wearing shades and you start seeing the world as a cool <laughs> uh, place. Um, but if you associate good ones, you adopt the language of the good people. And I had that in my mind um, when I learned this story and many other stories, you know, going to Dhamma school, Sunday school on Sundays, and also learning Buddhism as a subject in the school. We learn these Jataka tales, including the Satyagumba Jataka. So the name Satyagumba, as I said, is um, bristling, bristling spears uh, because this parrot learned, um, gain, you know, was named after that um, Satyagumba because that's, that's kind of a name that bandits would give. But the other parrot got the name Pupaka. That is, Pupaka means flowers. You are like a gentle little flower to us. <laughs> so it, it, it learned um, gentle qualities. 
And uh, so kids start to think about um, the, the, the moral of the story and learn, oh, I should, I should not spend too much time with uh, bad guys. And instead, I should spend time with the good, good one in the school. Good, uh, whoever is focused and does not do bad, bad things. So I, I also see the story also is an opportunity to teach self-control, sobriety, kindness, and truth. And when teaching kids, I especially use the, the five precepts that um, we monks teach kids and they recite all the time. Um, and the five precepts uh, briefly include uh, these concepts like kindness, compassion. So instead of killing and harming living beings, you choose compassion and kindness. Instead of stealing things that belong to others, you choose guarding and protecting them. Instead of engaging in sexual misconduct, you choose loving relationships, uh, trusting relationships. Uh, instead of telling lies, you choose to speak the truth and stand with the truth. And instead of um, learning to use substances, drugs, alcohol, intoxications, you learn to say no to them and be advocate about harm, harmfulness about these substances. Um, and when I teach five precepts, I usually bring the, um, I think it's like a metaphor. Um, I use a car, for example. When a car is going up the hill and it definitely goes down the hill, um, in both occasions, it needs <clears throat> all the features of it. Um, gas is a must. Steering wheel is a must. Brake fluids is a must. And um, engine is a must. And uh, whatever else, you know, the body is, uh, the windshield, say, <laughs> uh, is, is important. All side mirrors. These are like five precepts. And I tell kids, you know, when one, if any one of these pieces are missing, you are going to crash uh, uh, down the hill or up the hill. So it's important that we make sure that all the pieces are together and working well. And it gives you a safe ride till the end of your life. Not just this one journey from grade 1 to grade 11, but beyond that to the university. And even after and I sometimes bring stories of very bright kids who, you know, get into dental school, medical school, sometimes start using cocaine and stuff, and their life gets ruined. Um, and I also have the story of a 13-year-old girl who was introduced to some something in the school just before her maths test. And her friends, friend girls, perhaps were jealous of her performance. She was... The, the brightest kid for math. So she had it but just before the math test and uh, she, um, she was forced to have it. She said, okay, I will have a bit. I know it doesn't have any effect. But she was, uh, she dropped her guards and she had it and she said, I don't feel anything. And her friends encouraged her to have more. So she had more. And then she went into the test and she started, uh, she threw up and she started screaming and yelling at the teacher because she freaked out and the teacher freaked out as well. And the teacher ran to the principal and, uh, and they couldn't figure out the entire story until she was uh, off of this, whatever she had. And... Uh, Later, when the principal um, asked questions from the, the three girls involved, the two girls betrayed her, saying she brought it to the school. <laughs> you see how bad, import, you know, how important good company is there too, right? And, uh, and somehow the principal learned the truth and uh, suspended the two girls. I hope they discontinued doing that kind of thing again. But, you know, things like vaping has gone to schools. And I heard from a psychiatrist um, who came to this mindfulness conference uh, 
uh, she in a private chat she told me that vaping and throwing those plastic pieces into toilets have become a huge problem in schools um, and when it is banned they introduce non-invasive colors or the shapes of it and they too clog these toilets somehow you know kids alongside these stories need to learn how to respect uh, the properties the school and the the facility itself somehow that girl i think um, she never she can she finished her school and i'm still in touch with her and she's on her way to becoming a nurse um, so she if she, had she learned to say no on that day again in her life as she has always done uh, she wouldn't have gone down that path and um, so but it could have ruined her life also um, that's this is how things start to happen so good company is always important my dad though he was very um, strict after school we were not allowed to go to the village and play <laughs> if we were caught doing that we get whooped <laughs> That's the Sri Lankan, I think, South Asian way of disciplining kid, children. I remember jumping to the river when it was flooded. I think that was for good reasons. We jump and we, we swim uh, and end up uh, getting carried away with the current, but we somehow go to the other side and run all the way up, jump from the bridge and come down with friends who, you know, I think we were okay with the river water, but the flood could have killed us. So, um, and I think my father was right in all these occasions. I respect him for disciplining us and protecting us this way. Anyway, I will end here because we have the, the Zen group coming at seven. But before I end, do you have any questions or comments or anything to share? No, other than we could use a few parrots talking about flying around us these days in the world about compassion and kindness. That could work. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel, for saying that. Yes, um, especially yeah. in areas uh, affected by war and crime. Yeah. Lacking space for loving kindness, right? Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Yeah. It's always enjoyable. Thank you, too. Anything from your okay. side? We will share merits in just a moment, but anything you want to share? Well, my mind thinks that though sometimes you are the negative pair without realizing it. Mm -hmm. And that can just make life feel permanently dark. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that like simply moving to the other camp and then allowing enough time for your minds to reset as the parrot yeah loses the old ways yeah you know and then relearns the new ones absolutely sometimes when you get back in a negative place with like depression or anxiety or something like that just simply knowing that it's like hey i can actually shift out of this right can be helpful absolutely um i think not identifying with these past experiences and then um, avoiding triggers, right? And for that, having a safe environment that you choose to live um, where you are safe, welcomed, and, and also deep inside you have the wisdom that... Um, Whatever happened in the in the past is it just happened, and suffering with it is optional, right? <laughs> um, and <laughs> life life continues, and we embrace the good company or good environment and continue making, you know, continue facing it. Really, um, creating positive uh, energies, positive moments. Um, and embracing whatever comes your way, you know. Whatever will be, will be. But again, you are on the safe side, you are on the good company side, and you are the good parrot too. <laughs> right? 
Right. Shall we wrap up? Okay. Let's share. Have May. a good week, folks. You too. May the suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect us, protect the Buddha's teachings. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good night.